Story two of Christmas Eve and Christmas Day, ten Christmas stories by Edward Everett Hale. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story two, Christmas Waits in Boston, Part three. And so I walked home. Better so, perhaps, after all, than in the lively sleigh with the tinkling bells. It was a calm and silent night, seven hundred years and fifty-three, had Rome been growing up to might, and now was queen of land and sea. No sound was heard of clashing wars, peace brooded o'er the hushed domain. Apollo, Pallas, Jove, and Mars held undisturbed their ancient reign in the solemn midnight centuries ago. What an eternity it seemed since I started with those children singing carols! Bethlehem, Nazareth, Calvary, Rome, Roman senators, Tiberius, Paul, Nero, Clement, Ephraim, Ambrose, and all the singers, Vincent de Paul and all the loving wonder-workers, Milton and Herbert and all the carol-writers, Luther and Knox and all the prophets. What a world of people had been keeping Christmas with Sam Perry and Lycidas and Harry and me! And here were Yokohama and the Japanese, the Daily Argus and its ten million tokens and their readers, poor Fanny Woodhull and her sick mother there, keeping Christmas too. For a finite world, these are a good many weights to be singing in one poor fellow's ears on one Christmas tide. "'Twas in the calm and silent night the senator of haughty Rome impatient urged his chariot's flight from lordly revel rolling home. Triumphal arches gleaming swell his breast with thoughts of boundless sway, what wrecked the Roman and what befell a paltry province far away in the solemn midnight centuries ago? Within that province far away went plodding home a weary boor, a streak of light before him lay, fallen through a half-shut stable door across his path. He passed, for naught told what was going on within. How keen the stars, his only thought, the air how calm and cold and thin, in the solemn midnight, centuries ago. Streak of light! Is there a light in Lycidas's room? They not in bed? That is making a night of it. Well, there are few hours of the day or night when I have not been in Lycidas's room, so I let myself in by the night key he gave me, ran up the stairs, it is a horrid seven-storied first-class lodging-house. For my part, I had as lief live in a steeple. Two flights I ran up, two steps at a time. I was younger then than I am now pushed open the door, which was ajar, and saw such a scene of confusion as I never saw in Mary's overnice parlour before. Queer! I remember the first thing that I saw was wrong was a great ball of white German worsted on the floor. Her basket was upset. A great Christmas tree lay across the rug, quite too high for the room. A large, sharp-pointed Spanish clasp knight was by it, with which they had been lopping it. There were two immense baskets of white papered presents, both upset, but what frightened me most was the center table. Three or four handkerchiefs on it, towels, napkins, I know not what, all brown and red and almost black with blood. I turned, heart-sick, to look into the bedroom, and I really had a sense of relief when I saw somebody. Bad enough it was, however, Lycidas, but just now so strong and well, lay pale and exhausted on the bloody bed, with the clothing removed from his right thigh and leg, while over him bent Mary and Morton. I learned afterwards that poor Lycidas, while trimming the Christmas tree and talking merrily with Mary and Morton, who by good luck had brought round his presents late, and was staying to tie on glass balls and apples, had given himself a deep and dangerous wound with the point of the unlucky knife, and had lost a great deal of blood before the hemorrhage could be controlled. Just before I entered, the stick tourniquet which Morton had improvised had slipped in poor Mary's unpractised hand at the moment he was about to secure the bleeding artery, and the blood followed in such a gush as compelled him to give his whole attention to stopping its flow. 
He only knew my entrance by the "Ah, Mr. Ingham!" of the frightened Irish girl, who stood useless behind the head of the bed. "Oh, Fred!" said Morton, without looking up, "I am glad you are here." "And what can I do for you?" "Some whiskey, first of all." "There are two bottles," said Mary, who was holding the candle, "in the cupboard behind his dressing glass." I took Bridget with me, struck a light in the dressing room, how she blundered about the match, and found the cupboard door locked. Key, doubtless, in Mary's pocket, probably in pocket of another dress. I did not ask, took my own bunch, willed tremendously that my account-book drawer key would govern the lock, and it did. If it had not, I should have put my fist through the panels. Bottle of bedbug poison, bottle marked Bay Rum, another bottle with no mark, two bottles of Saratoga water. Set them all on the floor, Bridget. A tall bottle of cologne, bottle marked in M.S. What in the world is it? Bring that candle, Bridget. Oh, distillet, Maroon, Montreal. What in the world did Lycidas bring distilled water from Montreal for? And then Morton's clear voice in the other room. As quick as you can, Fred. Yes, in one moment. Put all these on the floor, Bridget. Here they are at last. Bourbon whiskey. Corkscrew, Bridget. Indeed, sir, and where is it? Where? I don't know. Run down as quick as you can and bring it. His wife cannot leave him. So Bridget ran, and the first I heard was the rattle as she pitched down the last six stairs of the first flight headlong. Let us hope she has not broken her leg. I, meanwhile, am driving a silver-pronged fork into the bourbon corks, and the blade of my own penknife on the other side. Now, Fred! From George within. We call Morton George. Yes, in one moment, I replied. Penknife blade breaks off. Cork pulls right out. Two crumbs of cork come with it. Will that girl never come? I turned round. I found a goblet on the washstand. I took Lycidas's heavy clothes-brush and knocked off the neck of the bottle. Did you ever do it, reader, with one of those pressed glass bottles they make now? It smashed like a Prince Rupert's drop in my hand, crumbled into seventy pieces, a nasty smell of whiskey on the floor, and I, holding just the hard bottom of the thing with two large spikes running worthless up into the air. But I seized the goblet poured into it what was left in the bottom, and carried it in to Morton as quietly as I could. He bade me give Lycidas as much as he could swallow, then showed me how to substitute my thumb for his and compress the great artery. When he was satisfied that he could trust me, he began his work again silently, just speaking what must be said to that brave Mary who seemed to have three hands because he needed them. When all was secure, he glanced at the ghastly white face, with beads of perspiration on the forehead and upper lip, laid his finger on the pulse, and said, We will have a little more whiskey. No, Mary, you are overdone already. Let Fred bring it. The truth was that poor Mary was almost as white as Lycidas. She would not faint, that was the only reason she did not, and at the moment I wondered that she did not fall. I believe George and I were both expecting it, now the excitement was over. He called her Mary and me Fred, because we were all together every day of our lives. Bridget, you see, was still nowhere. So I retired for my whiskey again, to attack that other bottle. George whispered quickly as I went, Bring enough, bring the bottle. Did he want the bottle corked? Would that Celt ever come upstairs? I passed the bell-rope as I went into the dressing-room, and rang as hard as I could ring. I took the other bottle, and bit steadily with my teeth at the cork, only, of course, to wrench the end of it off. George called me, and I stepped back. No, said he, bring your whiskey. Mary had just rolled gently back on the floor. I went again, in despair. But I heard Bridget's step this time. First flight, first passage, second flight, second passage. She ran in, in triumph, at length, with a screwdriver. 
"No," I whispered, "no! The crooked thing you draw corks with." And I showed her the bottle again. "Find one somewhere, and don't come back without it." So she vanished for the second time. "Frederic!" said Morton. I think he never called me so before. Should I risk the clothes brush again? I opened Lycidas's own drawers, papers, boxes, everything in order, not a sign of a tool. "Frederic!" Yes, I said, but why did I say yes? Father of mercy, tell me what to do. And my mazed eyes, dim with tears, did you ever shed tears from excitement, fell on an old razor strop of those days of shaving made by C. Whittaker Sheffield. The Sheffield stood in black letters out from the rest like a vision. They make corkscrews in Sheffield, too. If this Whittaker had only made a corkscrew, and what is a Sheffield wimble? Hand in my pocket, brown paper parcel. Where are you, Frederick? Yes, said I, for the last time. Twine off, brown paper off, and I learned that the Sheffield wimble was one of those things whose name you never heard before, which people sell you in Thames Tunnel, where a hoof cleaner, a gimlet, a screwdriver, and a corkscrew fold into one handle. Yes, said I again. Pop, said the cork. Bubble, 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 said the whiskey. Bottle in one hand, full tumbler in the other, I walked in. George poured half a tumblerful down Lycidas's throat at that time. Nor do I dare say how much he poured down afterwards. I found that there was need of it, from what he said of the pulse, when it was all over. I guess Mary had some, too. This was the turning point. He was exceedingly weak, and we sat by him in turn through the night, giving at short intervals stimulants and such food as he could swallow easily. For I remember Morton was very particular not to raise his head more than we could help. But there was no real danger after this. As we turned away from the house on Christmas morning, I to preach and he to visit his patients, he said to me, did you make that whiskey? No, said I, but poor Dodd Dalton had to furnish the corkscrew. And I went down to the chapel to preach. The sermon had been lying ready at home on my desk, and Polly had brought it round to me, for there had been no time for me to go from Lycidas' home to D Street and to return. There was the text, all as it was the day before. They helped every one his neighbor, and every one said to his brother, be of good courage. So the carpenter encouraged the goldsmith, and he that smootheth with the hammer, him that smote the anvil. And there were the pat illustrations, as I had finished them yesterday, of the comfort Mary Magdalene gave Joanna, the court lady, and the comfort the court lady gave Mary Magdalene after the mediator of a new covenant had mediated between them how Simon the Cyrenian and Joseph of Arimathea and the beggar Bartimaeus comforted each other, gave each other strength, common force, comfort, when the one life flowed in all their veins, how on board the ship the tent-maker proved to be captain and the centurion learned his duty from his prisoner, and how they all came safe to shore because the new life was there. But as I preached I caught Fry's eye. Fry is always critical, and I said to myself, Fry would not take his illustrations from eighteen hundred years ago. And I saw dear old Dodd Dalton trying to keep awake, and Campbell hard asleep after trying, and Jane Magerie looking round to see if her mother did not come in, and Ezra Shepherd looking not so much at me as at the window beside me, as if his thoughts were the other side of the world. And I said to them all, Oh, if I could tell you, my friends, what every twelve hours of my life tells me, of the way in which woman helps woman and man helps man, when only the ice is broken, how we are all rich so soon as we find out that we are all brothers, and how we are all in want, unless we can call at any moment for a brother's hand, then I could make you understand something in the lives you lead every day of what the new covenant, the new commonwealth, the new kingdom is to be. But I did not 
dare tell Dodd Dalton what Campbell had been doing for Todd, nor did I dare tell Campbell by what unconscious arts old Dodd had been helping Lycidas. Perhaps the sermon would have been better had I done so. But when we had our tree in the evening at home, I did tell all this story to Polly and the bairns, and I gave Alice her measuring tape, precious with a spot of Lycidas's blood, and Bertha her Sheffield wimble. Papa, said old Clara, who is the next child, all the people gave presents, did not they, as they did in the picture in your study? Yes, said I, though they did not all know they were giving them. Why do they not give such presents every day, said Clara? Oh, child, I said, it is only for thirty-six hours of the three hundred and sixty-five days that all people remember that they are all brothers and sisters, and those are the hours that we call, therefore, Christmas Eve and Christmas Day. And when they always remember it, said Bertha, it will be Christmas all the time. What fun! What fun, to be sure! But, Clara, what is in the picture? Why, an old woman has brought eggs to the baby in the manger, and an old man has brought a sheep. I suppose they all brought what they had. I suppose those who came from Sharon brought roses, said Bertha. And Alice, who is eleven and goes to the Lincoln School, and therefore knows everything, said, Yes, and the Damascus people brought Damascus wimbles. This is certain, said Polly, that nobody tried to give a straw, but the straw, if he really gave it, carried a blessing. End of Story 2, Part 3